uh, I'd like to introduce Shivani Basu. Uh, Shivani was born in Calcutta. She's basically lived in almost every South Asian city, from uh, Dhaka to Kathmandu, uh, Delhi. Uh, she's currently living in London. She's a journalist by profession, uh, reporting for the ABP in uh, a Dhaka-based uh, publication, uh, as well as the Telegraph in the UK. She's the author of three books. Uh, the first book is called uh, Curry, the story of Britain's favourite dish, which is what we'll be talking about today. Her second book is called Spy Princess, the life of uh, Noor and Ayat Khan. And her third book, uh, Victoria and Abdul, which she's doing sessions on each of these books at the festival. Mm, which, what's tomorrow? Um, no, we'll be uh, her, her love for history and her writing about uh, of history has really come from her observations of living in both India and, and England. So um, all three books have uh, very strong connections between India and, and uh, England. On my left hand side we have uh, the wild and waggy, uh, <laughs> one of my best friends is Vicky Dyer. Uh, this is um, actually his book launch today, which is very exciting. Uh, it's his first novel, uh, it's called Gone with the Vindaloo. Uh, actually, Vicky, born in India and uh, is a serial entrepreneur, and had this story pent up inside him for at least a lifetime, taking 10 years to, to write it. Um, we're going to start firstly by uh, with, with studying slightly more serious uh, the history of curry, and uh, we'll go on to the tales of Vicky and Gone with the Vindaloo. <laughs> so, uh, Shivani, curry in the UK. I have read uh, some amazing statistics in your book about. Uh, how curry is, you know, the dish of Britain, and how it's become the, British, the, the dish of Britain, which is quite surprising considering, uh, for most part of its history, Britain's food has not been known for its food, uh, and certainly if it has been known for its food, it's been known for its fish and chips and very bland roast, roast dinners. So maybe you could enlighten us with uh, some of these incredible statistics. Well, you see, that's probably the name it right there, you see? That, that is the reason they love curry. I mean, you know, we've got uh, fish and chips, and we all love fish and chips. But the rest was so bland that they came to India. We, we go back, they came to India. The East India Company came here looking for spices. So we go back 400 years of the spice trade. But it is Britain's favorite food. Every survey they do is like, what is a favorite dish? And it's this dish called chicken tikka masala. In the train, it's even got a, you know, it's got CTM in the restaurants. Not a CTM. And, uh, you know, I used to think, we don't even get this in Delhi, it's not served, and I don't think it's served here either. It's probably come back through Britain, because the Brits come here and they want to eat a masala. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's a dish that didn't exist, but it's their favorite dish there. Um, they eat poppers, which we call popper. And in the South India, they call it poppers, so the Brits make it popper. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Hindu, <laughs> you know, my, me and my mom and me, dad and bucket of Hindu and we're going to be too with it. But of course, uh, it didn't. <laughs> so how did all this happen? How did it become so popular? Well, as I said, you know, they started 400 years ago. They came here to India to you know, looking for spices. And uh, once they come here and they eat the food and they were instantly seduced, who wouldn't be? They ate the korma and they ate the biryanis and they ate all this fabulous food. And there was no going back. That's it. So when it happened both ways, when they went back, in, you know, those who went back to India, they started cooking curries. And because they were so innovative, they bottled them up. I mean, the word curry doesn't take, I mean, we don't say we are going to cook a curry today, right? We, we, use, we cook Indian food, South Indian, North Indian, whatever, you know. But uh, the race, the word curry, I mean, they invented that, that as well. And then they did this whisk thing of curry powders. So they invented curry powders, bottled it up, took it away, so they could cook it in their homes. So right, 17th century, 18th century, they were cooking these in, um, in English kitchens. And, um, but uh, it's not only, really, it's not only, really, I guess, curry in England has not just become famous because of the, the, the men subs who returned back to, or the subs who returned back from India to the subcontinent, but uh, actually a lot of credit should go to the Bangladeshis. In fact, many of the restaurants are not owned by Indians, perhaps you could... Exactly, and when I first went to London, I mean, this book arose out of reportage, basically, because I was constantly intrigued when I went there in 87 first, and I would see every high street always had an Indian restaurant. And they would have, they would have these absurd names, like Gurkha Tanduri. I mean, I would say, you know, Gurkha Sunki, they Tanduri, <laughs> or of course, it would be all around nostalgia, last days of the Raj, Viceroy, etc., etc. Then you go inside, and then of course, there's this popular and <coughs> Chinese issue we never had. <laughs> as a starter, and all the cooks uh, and the restaurant owners were Bangladeshi. So they weren't even cooking Indian food, they were, not, they were all serving North Indian food prepared for the palate. I just wanted to trace this journey, how did Bangladeshi come here 80% and start, you know, serving Indian food and making it the most popular dish. So, yes, they, they were the ones who did it actually, according to the high street. But in fact, the, uh, the very first curry house in Britain wasn't a Bengali. He was actually an Indian. Perhaps you'd like to. Uh... He was actually from Panta. So, uh, <coughs> had his contribution. He was this exotic, very adventurous man, and uh, his name was Saki B. Mohammed. And he ran away, he married an Irish woman, <coughs> and then he went to London. And in 1810, he set up the first curry house, and he called it the Hindustani Coffee House. And he catered it for all the East India Company amounts who would come back. So it was very, it was an upper end, high end uh, restaurant. <coughs> so it had peacock feathers, cane chairs, and sake being a woman would dress up in a turban, very elaborate clothes. And he would do the whole Rajasthan, you know, East India Company Rajasthan thing, and advertised it as a, a place for, um, you know, returning amounts and Indian gentlemen. So he had the top clientele coming, and he had hookers kept in the other in the inside rooms. He did the whole experience. Um, but he didn't last very long. He almost went. And it closed down. But that was uh, 200 years ago. There is a big plaque now to mark the site. And it's now, I think it's a sushi place or something. <laughs> Enjoy it. <laughs> um, your book is, is uh, all about the history of curry, but actually with continual references to Britain and the UK. But of course, curry has a much greater bigger and, and a much older history than just curry in Britain. Um, and there are many books written, for example, the one written by Lizzie Collingham, who talks about curry from 4,000 years ago, uh, and many stories about that. But actually, I suppose, uh, when we're talking in, re in reference to the UK, um, how did actually all this curry come about? I suppose, if you want to touch on the, the spice walls and the spice trade. Well, what happened is, you know, many of the things we take as granted, like you think of red chilies and chili powder as Indian now, they, didn't, they were not actually native to India. So they came with, with the Portuguese, who had found them in, in, you know, in, the, in Latin America. So they came with the Portuguese, they introduced chili to us. And that is now so much more to come to see. And along with that, some similar other spices. I mean, Peru used to give heat to uh, Indian dishes at that time. And chilies came with the Portuguese. So then the Brits introduced tomatoes, there were no tomatoes in India. So various things actually happened as part of them planting them, making them over. Uh, but that's, that's how it always happens. I mean, food is 
about evolution, so things change, and that's why we have a chicken tikka masala created between Brickley and Bradford. I forgot what the dish called, the dish chef, but it's become a favorite dish. So, uh, I mean, if we think about the Roman time, going back actually in the, 13, in the 13th, 14th century, Venice really monopolized um, the spice trade with gold, swapping gold for spices. Um, but in terms of uh, the UK's actual contribution, I suppose it was um, when uh, Jen Gear was in power in the, in the late 17th century, when the Brits really started to try and negotiate to open up uh, room for them. And as, as we know, you know, they came as traders and stayed off to become rulers, which is why you know, history is what, it all started with that black pepper. But uh, yeah, so they came here and they loved the food. They took it back, you know, bottles and recipes. And uh, what people don't know is that even in the 19th century, it's like in 1845, it was actually quite up class to be having these curries because spices were expensive. So only those who could afford it and they would show off if they were making these curries because you know you've got these exotic ingredients. And uh, in fact, Mika has the sequence in her film, isn't it? And they went back to it, it well when they're tasting these curries because it was so exotic at that time. Um, but um, in 1845, there was this Duke of Norfolk. He's an amazing person because he says, he actually, he said he prescribes, he doesn't marry internet, he prescribes a curry as a cure for famine because he says uh, it was the time of the Irish famine and uh, there was also a lot of shortages in, in Britain. And uh, he says, uh, if a man goes to bed hungry, he gives this speech. And he says, if a man goes to bed hungry, uh, he should, uh, take a glass of warm water and stir in a spoon of curry powder and he'll go to bed happy and you know, he won't be hungry anymore because the spices are you know, cane pepper and it's good for him. So he was really pilloried, yes. he was called the curry powder duke and he was pilloried and there were, it went on for a whole year and it's like punch and he was, you know, they had poems about him saying that, you know, this is the cure for curry powder, he's the cure for family these curries. So they made a lot of fun. Well, uh, the, the Duke and the, the, the controversial curry powder Duke, um, curry also had its patrons of very other uh, from the royal courts. Perhaps you'd like to tell us a bit about Queen Victoria, who actually never stepped foot on the subcontinent, but yet uh, had quite a punch on for curry. Well, Queen Victoria had an enormous appetite. <laughs> she, she had, she had a huge empire, of course, and she also had a, you know, appetite that matched it. So she never came to India, she never came to India, but she longed to come to India. She really wanted to, you know, feel the <coughs> dust as it were, travel around. Um, so she did the next best thing. She was sent to Indians as presents. <laughs> when you're the queen, you know, you get presents like that. So these two Indians were wrapped up, and they, they were sent to her for her golden jubilee. And um, they popped out and they were And they were supposed to, they were just supposed to stand at a table, just stand behind her, look decorative and look fabulous. And she was empire, uh, you know, Empress Malika in this bar. Um, so this one of them was very Empress Indian. He was, you know, he was from Agra, he was going to make good. Uh, he was told to please the queen eat Tikra Gopa. So he did what he was carrying his spice box and one day he decided to make her a curry. So he made her something. And he was carrying it, so it was an authentic curry. It was probably the first time she actually made an authentic curry, which was some curry powder stuff. And um, she loved it. She wrote in her journals, had curry cooked by an Indian chef, and it was excellent. And so she gave the royal order that a curry would be cooked in the royal kitchens every day. And this actually happened for 13 years that since she tasted her first curry, curries were cooked in the royal kitchens. <laughs> Every day, every day. And her favorite was chicken curry and dal, which they used to spend years here at the car. And um, she would serve it to all the visiting Indians that she would show off. So she had this Darbar hall that she built in her history. Mountain, you had to come to a home she could travel. So, you know, there she was with her Darbar hall. And by then she acquired many more Indian servants. So there was a whole red <coughs> And they took over a corner of the palace. And there were these descriptions written by the other English chefs, so they took it over. <laughs> And they're grinding the masadas, you know, uh, as they do with big stones and everything, not using the curry powders. And they had to, because they're all Muslim uh, chefs, they used to do the, they had to, um, you know, kill their own natural and have halal meat. 
So all these chickens running around against the castle, <laughs> and hens, and they would catch them, and they would kill them, and they would do everything, and um, serve it up. And she would then serve this feast, and she was also learning Urdu from our man, who was doing very well for himself by now. So he was no longer a good at all. He was a personal secretary uh, of Dulkarim, mm -hmm. his name was. And um, he taught her Urdu, so she would sit there, serve this Indian food, um, you know, say a few lines in Urdu, and just play her role, that dream role of Empress of India. And um, <coughs> she, was, she was really enjoying it. And in fact, there was this uh, incident when um, the Sarkar Nasrullah from Afghanistan, he comes visiting, and he's starving in London for two days because he can't get any halal food. And then he comes to visit Queen Victoria, and she serves him all this. And he's so delighted that he writes about it. So there was a bit of, you know, curry diplomacy. <laughs> and uh, Prince Albert was also a curry mom. Yes, yes, yes. Albert loved curry. Her son, Edward VII, he hated uh, curry and he hated all the Indian servants. He hated Uncle Curry. And so he didn't like curry. So her grandson, George, uh, he loved curry. And he would go in search of a uh, grass, you know, from he would, he would cross the land to go for that. Yeah. Did, he, was he the, was, did he have a French chef who he tried to train to uh, cook <laughs> to, to recreate? To because the journey used to be six weeks back on the ship those days. So he had to do for six weeks without curry, which he couldn't do. So he tried to train the French chefs to cook curry. It did not successful. <laughs> um, obviously, there, are, there have been many different crazes. Uh, of curry in England. I mean, it started with particular masalas <laughs> craze, it then moved on to the tandoor craze, uh, and uh, in the mid '80s we had the bow, the Balti, the Balti rage. Oh, that's um, Balti. Balti. Well, that was that was And they would 
would, um, how do we know this? Because they would exchange recipes. So there's this lady corner of the 19th century newspapers, where all these ladies, you know, they exchange all their recipes. And um, even Mrs. Uh, you know, Isabel Beaton, hers was, the, she was like the Bible of cooking. She had her own kind of recipes. And they would curry everything, you know, they'd say curry this, curry this. Just throwing anything into a curry was their concept. And most of it was probably thought of, so they know when they should have come with health warnings. But um, anyway, yeah, they, they were doing that. And they would, and then Charlotte's, which is a company where they, know, where they sourced from Madras, and the ad was that the person came and he had this uh, fabulous curry and, uh, in, in Madras, and he said he was conquered forever. And then he, his advertisement became how he came and he ate the curry, so it was a five point curry. And um, the ad goes, how Mr. Charwood was conquered by curry. And you know, there are many ads which they ran. Um, Shabbat still exists today in the space, I think it was Japanese. So um, we're going to move on from the history of curry uh, to the future of the We're going to turn to uh, this wonderful book, um, Gone with the Vindaloo. So, Vicky, um, what a fantastically fun book it is. Um, it's a rollicking read and it had me gripped from chapter one right to the last to the last page. Um, he's just launched it at Jaipur Literary Festival. Today is his, is his book launch in uh, Lahore. We're honoured to have you here. Uh, the book is filled with wonderful characters. You have uh, men sabs and sabs, you have uh, randy swamis, you have nirvana seeking Russian Americans, uh, spoiled private school children, uh, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> upper class civil servant families. Yes. Um, but uh, one of the things, having got to know you a bit over the last week, is definitely uh, your writing style is incredibly tongue in cheek. Um, and certainly uh, the book is very saucy uh, <laughs> in, in, in many ways more than one. Um, so I, I think we should start perhaps with you just telling. Uh, everyone a little bit about the book, give them an outline of what the book is actually about. Actually the book is a, I hope, a very humorous take, not a very serious take on, you know, colonialism, caste, imperialism, the writing of history, media, branding and so on and so forth. And uh, I, I would try to, try to imagine that this tongue in cheek and would like it to be like that. Now, it's taken me, what, 10 to 12 years to write. It's uh, started off with the fact that I was in the garment business. Where I was, this, you know, just, we were manufacturing for brand. You know, so whether if Ralph Lauren told us that you have to make it ten cents cheaper, there were ten other chaps who were going to do it. So we had this, so this whole power of the brand was beginning to kind of irritate me. And uh, also, I believe uh, very sincerely that an individual skill is uh, <coughs> far more precious than all this branding. But yet, with the uh, sort of this almost maniacal thing about getting brands established and giving them personalities and all kinds of things. I think the individual skill has, uh, I mean there is a chance that it just might vanish. So this is basically a result of this book is, and cooking is a great thing. I mean you know, there you are, you've got everything around you, you're going to be cooking. If things go wrong, it's your headache. If things go right, you get the applause. So there's no one you can blame, really. you know, there's no market forces. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so it's a great thing, so that, that's what's kind of made me do this book. Great. We are, of course, we're not going to give too much away uh, because we all wanted to read it. Um, and we're not going to mention the word Vindaloo again uh, because uh, actually the Vindaloo is the theme of, is, is one of the central themes of the, of the book. Obviously, it's in the, it's in the title. Uh, but yes, he says, um, food. There's a lot of incredibly salivating descriptions of food, from hot towers with popping cumin and uh, delicious um, curries and uh, all sorts of wonderful, wonderful kebabs, everything. And by the end of it, you're absolutely desperate to go out and find some street food and <laughs> stuff your face with all sorts of delicious, delicious goodies. Um, there's a, there is a, a, a part in the book which is um, about one of my favourite dishes uh, which comes from, well, famous in Lahore, Nihari. Nihari. Uh, Nihari. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so perhaps you could uh, read about Nihari. <coughs> Okay, 
Okay, so you know, uh, the uh, bureaucrat's family has now been transferred to Delhi. And there are three generations of cook, uh, cooks. You know, the guy, the, the grandfather is no longer alive. It's the father and the son. And the father started his cooking in Delhi. And he's coming back from Orissa to Delhi. So here he is, taking his son for the... And he's been telling the story to his son of his father's time. And this is, he's taking him of his grandfather there. Pakwan's grandfather. And he's getting him in now to Delhi to share with him the experiences which he as a father to a son actually has had. So this is the, and Nihari is one of them. So, you know, uh, he takes him uh, for a trip to the old city. So, uh, you know, they got off at the end of Darya Ganj and turned left into Urdu Bazaar. I mean, it's just the way you enter Jama Masjid. This is the place my son Param said, bombing, bombing, and with a grand sweep of his hand, ushered him into the old city. Here is the Jama Masjid, Chani Chowk, Matiya Mahal, Kali Kavit, Kababiya, Kari Pauli, Arma, Kari Chowk, He rattled off with the familiarity of an old waiter who knew the menu of his establishment like the back of his hand. This is the heart of Purani Delhi, where food is robust, the charts tasty, the masalas pure, the lassi thick and creamy, the pistaki lodge loaded with pistachio and desi ghee, and what we are about to eat in a few moments, the nihari, is uplifting in more ways than one. Zabardast <laughs> nihari, <laughs> <laughs> the sign red and below it, in a confident flourish, asli nihari ki dukan, the shop for true nihari. The early birds milled around, able to put their nihari and khamiri on tables as they sat standing up. The late Latif sitting on the floor, eating with plates on their laps. Pakwan hoped that they had not run out. Figure not beta, his father said, as he reading his mind. Oh, Zabandast Mia, he bellowed, hands cupped around his mouth, his voice floating over the crowd. Abe Salim Kathwe Param, the man behind the date cheese and the patila is doling out the nihari knowledge without so much as looking up. The, the crowd allowed them passage to the open kitchen, the delightful joys of reunion, their hugs and their handshakes, they being served out of term, even making space for them on tables so that, they, so that they could eat in relative comfort in the deference to an obviously long and warm friendship. Asli Nihari is always made with thin cuts of meat from the muscles of cows and thighs, simmered overnight on the gentlest of coal fires with onions, turmeric, garlic, red chilies, sprinkled with a touch of the freshest garam masala and a generous dash of song and is ready to eat after the first morning prayer a bowl full of thanks to Allah for the bounty of Dharthi Mata. People around the table and those within earshot fell silent and Param realized that he had an audience. But my good friend Zabu Mia, he said, pointing at Zabardast, gives his Nihari a special twist and adds a rich black extract from the bark of a tree, which when cooked in meat, arouses flagging desires. <laughs> many who have tried in vain to become fathers have fathered many sons after a few helpings. <laughs> He blew or gone in everyday parlance, Shilajit in Sanskrit, meaning the invincible rock, if you know what I mean, he winked, smiling. <laughs> Pakwan blushed and the men who gathered, had gathered around laughed. Zabu shook his head, breaking into a smile and some, who had eaten, walked off with a swagger of confident lotharios, sure that the day held exciting promises. <laughs> the patiras and the dekchis were empty. The last bits of gravy and nihari scraped off the bottoms and served to those who had arrived a little too late. Zabdu's establishment opened every day for only two hours in the morning, 6.30 to 8.30, enough time for the nihari to be finished. Two generations serving nihari for two hours every day of the week, allowing them to lead their life at the pace they chose. Pakwan was amazed. He asked Zabdu why he did not expand his business and Zabdu's answer was that of a simple, contented man, happy with his life. Listen, Rita. Always keep supply a bit short of demand, otherwise, how will there ever be longing? <laughs> and then, I mean, you know, then he takes him all over the place and uh, they take the bus back and they get home. And, uh, you know, the power of Asli Nihari, cooked in Gond or Shilajit, and Shilajit, by the way, in, uh, in, in uh, Latin, is actually called Escorter Punjabianam. <laughs> this is true. Punjabi. <laughs> Kicked in after he slept, he felt the beginnings of rock hard invincibility as the same long limbed, golden haired Virangi Pari, he dreamt about that Pari in floated into his dream once again. She wore a blouse of the finest gauze, the sensual slopes of her firm white breasts, exposed by a plunging neckline and a most generous bhagra, yards and yards of oil printed with green parrots with the reddest of beaks, bright intricate phases, 
yellow orange, marigolds, and pinched the smallest of gathers around a slim, supple young narrow waist. Pakal Pakwan's one standing at the rim of a giant cauldron, stirring the Rehari mixture. He ladled her a portion and he sucked in the pieces of meat hungrily, marveling at the taste, and with a blue and, a, and with a blue lidded eyes, uh, blue eyes beaming with lust, she waggled a finger languorously at him, sure that he would join her. Pakwan floated down using his long ladle as support and his father's voice, a deep, mischievous baritone, could be heard from the skies, providing the soundtrack for his dream with amazing type subtitles like a movie. <laughs> and here is the thing, it says, Pakao Nihari, Banao Nihari, Aisha, Aisha, or Ho, Pele, Ishdi Ka Khamba, Phir Das Gaj Lamba, Pan Jai. Kup Nihari, I am not translating it, Kup Nihari made your daily wage, and that thing between your legs will grow at every stage. From electric pole to 10 yards length, for Nihari gives you solid strength. <laughs> especially after 1857, have managed to <coughs> slot everybody into these castes and, you know, call somebody criminal caste and tribe, somebody, you know, shot in the game, you know, that kind of stuff, you know, it was like that. So, uh, this, uh, and he, Cunningham, by the local population is called Chatur Chutar, because <laughs> Cunning is, Cunning is uh, Chatur, and Ham comes from here, so he's called Chatur. And he dresses himself up always as a subject race, as we call it, and to figure out how, you know, the good Raj was doing. So when he's uh, there, uh, he sort of bumps into this guy, uh, Arth Purabia, which means meaning, Arth is meaning, and he's Purabia is from the east, so meaning from the east, and that's another, we think we mean a lot, right, we hear it. So he's uh, telling the story of Taiki, and he had a great hold on, his, on the audience when he told the story. Ah, he groaned when he saw his friends approaching. This Malish, he was having a head massage. Light is the load of time. The musty of Malish is more blissful than the heavens. My spirit, my spirit feels it is bubbling, like water on a slow rolling boil, relaxed and mischievous. You have, you have done your kasna, Katwa. Now it is time for me to spin my yarn. Mateen and my father laughed, admiring his wit. Mateen was the circumcised one, the Katwa. Your grandfather was the Katwa by caste, and Arth, the spinner of yarns. No offense taken, no offense meant, it was just another celebration of Bhai Bandi and easy congratulations. The hands cupped around their mouths and their heads thrown back. Mateen and Kalam announced in happy voices, Suno, Suno, listen you all citizens of Banaras, the great Hathpurabhya is ready to tell a story. Now he starts the story. Once upon a time spoke Arth in a voice loaded with ancientness. There was a forest so dense that even the sun god had to strain through the blackness to show his power like the belly of a deep, deep well. Thick, thick, tall, tall trees stretched towards the sky. Da 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 da. There were birds, big ones and small ones, colorful ones and dull ones, bara singers and spotted deer, uh, hogs and blue bulls, rabbits and jackals, mustier and peacocks, and the hero of our story, an old, sly, cunning, and ferocious tiger. But age and injury had slowed him down, and hunting for food had become a problem. So he turned to the village at the edge of the forest, where, they were, where there was easy game. At first, 
His shikar was cows and goats, but as the burden of age grew heavy and his strength and speed sagged, he had to satisfy his hunger with prey that was the slowest and easiest to kill. He paused, looking up at his audience, man. When the villagers found their, coy, the, their cows and goats missing, they were worried. But when the tiger killed a little child, ba pre ba, there was gather in the village. Drums were beaten, or thrust his hips at the crowd and mimicked the beating of drums with his hands. Announcements were printed and messages passed from mouth to mouth, offering generous rewards to any shikari who would kill the dangerous beast. The villagers were in luck. The news reached the famous and legendary Galicha Shikari. Galicha was brave and cunning and carried many guns. He was tall and fair. His shoulders were broader than the broadest, and his aim was absolutely deadly. Galicha was not his mere real name, but it stuck because he always carried a carpet and he spread on the machan while he gained weight. The carpet was made in Persia and was soft to the touch and depicted the scene of a tiger hunt. Imagine the guts of this man, hunting an animal as dangerous as the tiger and having a tiger hunting scene under his palm. <laughs> this show of guts was admirable and gave, it, gave the great Galicha an aura of fearlessness, but Ars eyes became big, big, round, round in frank admiration. What the tiger lacked in youthful vigor, he more than made up for in sheer time. Arth put his hand on his bent knees and thrust his head at the audience, his face sly and contradictory. This tiger could throw his roll like a ventriloquist, always confusing the enemy about his location, and this the great Galicia did not know. <coughs> the plans were made, the machan was placed in a tree with generous leafy parities, and the goat was put there, and so on and so forth. The jungle was filled with the nearly silence and Galicia's senses were finally stretched. In the distance, he heard the sound of twig snapping. It came from the right of the uh, go. The tiger realized that he might have given himself away, so he purred like a cat and threw his mule to the left of the go. Galicia swung the barrel of his gun, took careful aim and tie, tie, bang, bang. Two bullets crashed into the undergrowth and clods of earth and broken branches flew all around. During all this confusion, the tiger rushed at the goat, killing it with a vicious blow. While it sat down to enjoy the juicy meat, Galicia waited. In a little while, a satisfied burp slipped from the tiger's mouth and then threw his robe, wild and ferocious, straight at Galicia's face. Galicia jumped up, petrified, his sphincter almost giving way, but he managed to save himself the embarrassment of explaining his uh, smelly stain on the hunting scene. Come down, wrote the tiger, and Galicia, hypnotized by fear, climbed down as if in a trance. Turn around, the tiger bellowed. Arth said as he turned his back to the audience, and the tiger roared again, but slow, no taro, take off your pants. Arth thrust his ass at the crowd and mimicked the pulling down of trousers. And then, said Arth, the smell of victory on his face, Usneos ki gaan maan. The tiger, or Shikari's ass. Or as the crazy Angrez would say, he buggered the hunger. <laughs> the second time, the same thing happens. And the third time, this time, he goes, you know, he goes the third time, says, despite the two-time buggery, Galicia, Galicia's courage did not fail him. His honor was at stake, and he had to wipe out the military the humiliation of the inner assault. The third time he took his most powerful gun, whose bullets were as big as cannonballs and lay in wait. This time, too, the tiger appeared and tricked him. Once more, Galicia fired into emptiness and big, big, tall, tall trees were grouped as if there had been an earthquake. But when the dust, smoke, and confusion settled, the tiger rode for Galicia and for the third time in a row, Bhagavad <laughs> This time, the tiger could not help himself, and after he finished, he asked the great Galicia, his voice heavy with victorious sarcasm, Tell me, great hunter, तू यहाँ शिकार खेलने आता है गान मारता है। अरे, you have come here to enjoy the pleasures of शिकार और you come here to get bugged। तो मैंने slap the thighs, thump the others' backs, roared and guffawed, tears streaming down many faces। The women also laughed, but theirs was an embarrassed tickle, as if they were admitting that they too enjoyed the humour in such brutality. Arth waited for the laughter to subside and then asked, "Tell me, you people, what is the message of the story?" Silence. Everyone was deep in thought, and then a voice broke in. It's just a little joke, this story. It has no message. I have to agree that this is a story full of jest, but our thoughts, voice dropped, becoming low and heavy in this story. It says a lot about storytelling. This is the tiger's tale, glorifying his kind and stripping the hunter, a pathetic, idiotic figure with only a patrick of buggery behind him, of his pride and pain. If the hunter told the story, it would be different. The hunter would glorify his hunting, and the tiger would be weak and cowardly. You see, this is the problem with the story. Where the truth lies, nobody knows. It all depends on, on, on who narrates it. In war and in peace, the victorious vigorously tell their tales, and their vanquished lose their voices and are stripped of their virtue. Mm -hmm. yeah.
the characters that feature in the book is a family, a, civil, uh, a family from, uh, who are the, the father is a civil servant. And uh, his uh, name is Mahadev, <coughs> and his wife, Joan, and his three children, uh, Tekran, Govinda, and Gauri. Uh, how much of that family is actually, uh, when you're writing it, how much is autobiographical? Actually, all of it. In fact, uh, the gorgeous body is the audience. If you have to use All of it. Yeah, she's the audience. The, God of, the gorgeous body. She is. <laughs> yeah, but so that part of it is a pretty autobiographical. Uh, In which case, you were a terrible student. Absolutely. You are a brilliant cricket player. That's why, that's why I got into college. And you fought with your father. Pardon? No, I never fought with him. He fought with me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I never did bad, see, in, uh, in my... Academically, I wasn't the strongest. And uh, so, but luckily, you know, cricket saved me, so I managed to get into St. Stephen's College, which is supposed to be a big thing. Uh, and, uh, yes, it's... Uh, but it's sort of autobiographical till... Uh, take Ram gets to the US. After that, I sort of use my own imagination, but... One problem, I mean, people have always asked me this, that why is there, you know, this, if you have Tekra, Govinda and Gauri, it doesn't quite gel. You know, it has to be either GG and GE or you know, that kind of stuff. But I had to make it Tekra because uh, this pen pal stuff, you know, the, the Svetlana had to come here and, you know, with a name, and she had to come here to discover herself, you know, find an Iran. And if she saw in the pen pal stuff a Tekra uh, name, she would be thrilled and she would go for him. That's why the name came Tekram and it just so happens that Tekram is also market spelled backwards. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and there's a close over there, God. So, so uh, Svetlana is um, the final character we're going to talk about. And uh, as previously said, she's a, she's a Russian-American Navarro seeking uh, India-possessed young woman. Obsessed, possessed with absolutely, obsessed with everything uh, Indian. And uh, I guess one of the themes in your book is kind of East meets West and West meets East. And I have to say, as someone who's travelled a lot through India as a backpacker, I've come across a lot of these Narana seeking spellbots. <laughs> uh, either in ashrams or going to uh, learn Kundalini Yoga, etc, etc. And uh, more often than not, they get more than they actually bargained for. Much more. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'd like you to read um, the final passage for today um, about Svetlana. Okay. okay. You see, uh, Svetlana is all set to get, you know, fine in her And, uh, you know, she goes into this thing called Kundalini Yoga. <laughs> Now this uh, yoga, it has, you know, there are seven stages in the body and the first stage is the muladha, which is placed quite sort of suggestively between the brackets, you know, right there in the center. And uh, the, the best, the top one is Shastra, you know, when you get there, it's sort of, you get all like godlike almost, you can predict the future, you can do what the hell you like, that kind of stuff. And uh, the muladha, it's a three and a half coil state, uh, snake, you know, at the bottom of the vertebra. So each, there are seven, so there's three and a half, so it sort of goes half a coil at a time, you know, three and a half. You know. So the first half coil uh, is, gets you the, you know, releases your muladhar, which does good things, I think you'll become very healthy and, you know, maybe do you all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's the first stage, that is the first stage. And this guy who's her guru believes that chanting is the way to go, but in case it takes too long, he believes in direct intervention. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and this whole Kukulis thing is based, uh, you know, in the Shiv, it's a, the Shiv tradition. And he has this, uh, his, his guru is a guy who, uh, you know, has uh, made a poem of this. There are many, uh, many, many legends as to, the, you know, why the Shivling and all that kind of stuff. And I just took this one. And I must say that I did a good job with it into poetry. So this is what he said, he thinks. Oh, all you Shiv, Shiv Bhats, let me sing you a gana, a legend from the very old Shiv Purana. It has a lilt, it has a rhyme, this story from the most ancient of time. In the dense and virgin forest of Dharuk, pristine for many ages, there were some women who were single and some married to holy sages. They prayed to the great Lord Shiva, 
with a devotion without doubt. So our Lord came to test them and descended on Mother Earth. He had ash spit on his body and worn out a thing and stood there in the center, wickedly <coughs> holding his leg. <laughs> Some women, this is true, this is actually from a legend. Some women swooned in fright, but with others with him they played. And when the sages saw this, their tempers were terribly afraid. Chi Chi, Chi Chi, they said, this is such a power. So they all got together and gave him a deadly shrub. That's a curse. Uh, they cursed him with so much venom that his limb just fell to the ground. And after this happened, there was mayhem all around. The limb bounced all over the universe and in one mighty rage, burning everything it touched, confounding the holiest saint. Forgive us, forgive us, the sages cried. Hamko Karo Shama, as they sought the august audience of the one and only Brahma. Brahma heard them patiently, and this is the advice he gave. Advice they would remember till they all went to their grave. You may be the holiest of the holy, but you've done, but what you have done is very odd. He came as a guest to your ashram, and a guest must be treated like God. You're lucky I know his wife well enough to call her Arav. So listen to me carefully and you won't have to worry, Yaro. <laughs> Pray to the goddess Parvati with devotion and great grace, and the troubled limb will very surely find its resting place. <laughs> when this was done, all was well, no doubt with some loss of faith. The troubled limb finally found its rightful resting place. Wisely, Brahma told them never to curse in careless haste and to drench the limb with the water, flowers, and pure chandan paste. Remember this, remember this. It's a fixed and steady rule. For this is the only way the link will forever be cool. <laughs> Thank you, Vicky. Um, and now we're going to open up the floor for any questions you may have for on the, on the history of curry, um, for some more interesting tales, or uh, about Vicky's <laughs> Um, Vikram, obviously I'll be approaching you later for the exact address of that uh, Nahari house. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but actually my, my question, uh, Shravani, was for you. Um, when I grew up in the UK in the 60s, when I went uh, to Sunday lunch with uh, uh, friends of my parents, um, we would have curry occasionally, and it was a, a, a circle of white rice, and in the middle was mincemeat with the tiniest bit of packet curry powder, and on the side there was chopped banana, and raisins and, and <laughs> coconut, dried coconut. That's what I grew up with as a curry. And my grandmother should have known better. She was born in what was then Bombay. Uh, but even she served that. So what was that all about? Have you, is this something you've come across? Well, yes, all the time. I mean, as I said, it was, it was born on stone. I mean, but everybody, you know, this is what it was cooked those days. They blended it and they, they thought, I mean, there was many curry recipes which in the nineteen forties and eighties, early fifties, they were very popular. And they would put raisins and they would put almonds, they would put Everything they could into it, and it was just a wish to wash your walls down. Oh, that's what they ate, and thankfully, it's become much better. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, that's what it was those days. There were some wonderful, delicious things that the Brits took from India, and one was Worcester sauce, and then something called gentleman's relish. I don't know where Mama might be from, possibly from that, but it's rather mild. But they, their food was really transformed, as you said, when they had craft over it. And whereas their food, when they attempted to cook those dishes in India, it became very, very weird. And it's something called blamage, for instance, which was a sort of shame pudding, which President Hollande would be compared to. And other sort of things, very flowery, full of gelatin, and most unattractive. But some of the desserts that came down and then became, you know, part of the Anglican tradition. I think they, they still have a special place. <laughs>
came from uh, Malaysia. So the Kari is evolved not just from Britain and Madhu, so which is why it's called Malay TV, it's from Malaysia. Oh, I thought it was called the green. The green that's what, that's a common uh, mistake. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 